Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, Onward webinar, where we are launching a brand new report that we've recently uh, done, in fact, launched today, on community benefits and the way that having a community benefits program uh, will uh, unlock green infrastructure, renewable projects, transmission infrastructure, which currently is not viable. Um, I am not going to talk in too much detail about the report because we're joined by the report's author, uh, Jack Richardson, the head of energy and climate um, at Onward, who's going to run through some of the key findings. We haven't just done the policy work here. I think we've done some of the important political work through a series of focus groups that will share some of the quotes from uh, and an extensive poll of rural voters, which I think throws up some really interesting insights. So we'll start off with that opening from Jack, uh, and then we will move through to a response uh, from the Right Honourable Ed Miliband MP. We're delighted um, that Ed is happy to join us uh, today. Um, Shadow uh, Environment Secretary or Shadow Secretary of State for Climate Change and Net Zero, um, who will be offering some of his thoughts. Uh, and then we will turn to Steph Spiro, um, a, a journalist, the environment editor uh, and senior political correspondent at the Daily Express, who's written in real kind of detail about some of these policy issues uh, and about why they matter to voters and what some of the politics around them are. So we've got a real combination here, policy, the politics, and hopefully some of the real practical impact for communities, for bill payers and for others. Um, so without further ado, Jack, let's uh, hand over to you to talk us through the report. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, I was going to share my screen. Um, hopefully this works. Uh, is it working? Is it up there? Not right now, no. Okay. Um, there might be a slight problem with that. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I was going to talk through the report, actually, rather than fiddle around on Zoom online. Um, and then I'll, I'll share the slides afterwards um, with everyone who signed up. Um, so yeah, I'm sharing my screen now. Oh, perfect. Oh, brilliant. Okay, I'm going to do a proper Chris Witter style. Let, next slide, please, and if you don't mind. Um, so first of all, thanks, thanks uh, to Adam. Um, thanks to everyone in the audience who has joined us. Thanks in particular to to Ed and Steph um, for joining. Um, uh, my name is Jack Richardson. I'm the the head of energy and climate here at Onward. Um, here to talk about our new report, Power to the People, um, which was written by myself and also our other uh, co-authors of the brilliant Getting to Zero team. So Ned Hammond, Alex Luke and uh, Phoebe Bunt um, and supported by the wider Onward team as well. And the, the idea behind this report is how to unlock um, support uh, for energy infrastructure, especially onshore renewables. So that's wind farms and solar farms, but also grid infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to start with some basics. I'll say next slide, please, Adam. Um, if it comes on over. So the, the basics of start is uh, the move away um, from fossil fuels. Um, we know where we need to be going. We've just come out of a, an energy price crisis um, due to uh, the volatile nature of oil and gas markets in particular. Um, and so the government has laid down a target to move to a net zero power system by 2035. Um, and hopefully there'll be a graph up in a moment, but basically the North Sea oil and gas basin is running out. Um, we're looking at a 55% uh, production drop in gas by 2030 and a 75% drop by 2035. And the idea is to move to um, electricity for our energy system to have a uh, domestic source of electricity. So that's uh, nuclear power, that's some um, BECs, for example, interconnectors with other countries, um, but then also in particular um, onshore renewables. Um, the CCC uh, to say said to get to our 2035 net zero power target, I know Ed and Labour have a 2030 net zero power target, we'll have to build 2,600 offshore wind turbines, uh, 3,250 off onshore wind turbines, and then if it's all in fields, which I'm sure it won't be, um, around 1,100 uh, kilometres square of solar farms. Um, and then we'll also have to be building the uh, grid infrastructure come to, uh, that comes with that. So we're looking at about a 10% increase um, in pylons and lines and things like that. A lot of it coming on into East Anglia from the offshore wind farms um, in the Southern North Sea. Um, it does get overblown sometimes. A lot of it will actually um, come from line upgrades of existing lines across the country, but nevertheless, it is a real issue, especially for people who, um, who live in areas like East Anglia who aren't used to this infrastructure. Um, so, so there's the really this is this is a very cool graph. This is another very cool graph. Um, I'll also say next slide. Um, 
just to get to the the real juicy bit of this report. So local opposition, we we all know, um, kind of, we've all heard the horror stories. There's politicians from all parties, to be honest, including even the Green Party, um, trying to block solar farms, um, campaigning against uh, cheap renewables. Uh, they do it some, sometimes you see it for other uh, pieces of infrastructure as well, like new housing. Um, but the uh, the problem with uh, local opposition is that though it is quite often from uh, small minorities, they are very vocal. Um, so I said earlier on Twitter that there's not many people who get out of the bed in the morning to rave about the benefits of renewable energy, apart from greenies and uh, energy wonks. Um, and I want to draw in particular, um, Adam, if you just press next slide, it should navigate a little circle soon. In, uh, in 2016, we had the onshore wind ban uh, due to basically quite a lot of local opposition from uh, uh, onshore wind turbines sprouting up everywhere. And that was a real shame because if you go to the next slide, we'll see that that completely destroyed the, uh, the pipeline of onshore wind capacity in England. So again, if you press the next arrow, there'll, there'll come a little arrow in 2016 where you see England's uh, onshore wind uh, planning application rates falling off a cliff essentially, and it's never really recovered. Um, and there was some great analysis from the Energy Climate Intelligence Unit that found that in the, the last winter just gone where they had the gas price crisis, um, that cost bill payers 800 million pounds. Um, so this, this is quite serious and it's also particularly uh, burdensome to having these planning restrictions in place when we're trying to get to a decarbonized power grid, but also trying to secure our energy supplies as we run out of gas in the North Sea. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Adam. So the weird thing is, and um, many of the people in the audience will know this already, renewables are actually incredibly popular. Um, they're by far the most popular source of energy um, out of all, all the ones that you can choose, um, especially compared to nuclear or, or shale gas, for, uh, for example. Um, and it used to be that they weren't popular in the local area, and that was always the, uh, the, the catch was, aha, they're popular until they're, they're near people. So we did some polling with Public First, um, and I'd like to thank Public First as well. It was some brilliant polling with, of rural voters, and we found that there are majorities for wind farms three miles from people's homes. So Public, uh, they have a 57% support of uh, an onshore wind farm within three miles um, versus 17% opposition. So there's definitely a majority in favour. For solar farm, it's actually even better, and you can check the report for this, there's a 65% um 65% um, uh, in support solar farms and it might be a bit hard because they're that little bit smaller you can kind of hide in the trees etc cetera, etc cetera. um so we wanted to drill down first into why people might oppose renewables in their local area um so next slide please oh, that perfect um so what we found is that the benefits of renewable energy um people tend to perceive them uh they're, they're national benefits, essentially. So the highest one that came back was energy security, which is very understandable after Russia's second invasion of Ukraine in February last year. Um, cheaper energy over the past decades, we've seen monumental costs uh, falls in uh, renewable energy, particularly for wind and solar. And then also a healthier environment. So tackling climate change, that, that's that small, small uh, matter of, of uh, saving the planet. Um, whereas the negatives of renewables are all very local, so particularly disruption from construction, um, unattract unattractive aesthetics, uh, damage to the local environment, obviously development comes with damage to the local environment sometimes, and of course harming property values, things like that. I think what was interesting though, and this does prove that they're popular, is that the people saying there are no negatives at all, 21% uh, over on the chart on the, on the right, um, far outweigh those who are saying that there's no benefits at all to renewables, um, which is only 4%. So I thought that was quite an interesting, interesting stat. Um, next slide, please, Adam. So we wanted to do research into if and then how community benefits reduce local opposition. Um, so next slide, please. So what we found um, is that uh, there's a lot of people in support of re renewables nearby in their local area, 43% support without any money attached, um, and only 9% are opposed. But there's this bit in the middle, and if you just click on the arrow again, I'll highlight it, there's this bit in the middle, 37% of the public, and roughly the same across the other parties as well, that they would oppose renewable energy if it didn't have community benefits, but they would support it 
if it did come with community uh, with community benefits. So if you have community benefits, suddenly you've got 80% in support of a renewable project in their local area compared to just 9%, one in 10 people who don't want that. But if you've got no community benefits, then suddenly you have a majority against renewable energy. And this is where we start to find it getting really interesting. And it also um, comes across in the, in the next poll on the next slide. It, it matches almost like for like that people think that new, new renewable energy developments should be required to contribute to the local area. And there's precedence for this, for example, in, in the nuclear power sector. Um, so three quarters of people um, do support community benefits being mandatory, essentially. Uh, next slide, please. So there's been a, a big debate recently, especially um, since November, December last year, when Simon Clark, who, um, and I do apologise, I forgot to also thank him at the start of uh, for writing a brilliant forward um, and supporting this report. Um, but Simon Clark led a uh, an amendment campaign on the levelling up and regeneration bill last year to lift the ban on onshore wind. And ever since then, we've had a, a bit of debate in, especially in in energy Twitter world, um, but also in in the in the national newspapers around what should people get in return for accepting this infrastructure and energy bill rebates or cheaper energy, even free energy um, for some politicians has always been the way. Uh, polling of rural voters picked up on that and over 50% of people without a figure said that they wanted energy bill rebates. Um, but when we did the maths, we figured that this actually wasn't really that possible, not at least without putting up everyone else's bills to unacceptable levels because Fundamentally, there's more people who live in England than compared to Scotland, where a lot of onshore wind is per se. So to make sure that everyone has 50 percent or free energy, you'd have to really stick up the cost of those developments. And then that money would then or that cost would get passed on to other bill players. So um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Adam. Um, oh, sorry, this is some really interesting. We also did some focus groups also run by uh, by uh, Public First. Um, and it really showed that across the parties, uh, voters really did want um, free energy. That was something that really appealed to them, certainly understandable after the past year when we've seen shocking energy prices going up for the roof. Um, however, um, next slide, please. When you start to put a figure on it, a realistic figure, um, so we figured that for a 12 megawatt, a medium sized onshore wind farm, you could probably do about a 75 percent, uh, 75 pound annual bill reduction. Um, and that's an annual payment. So um, far less on a monthly basis, probably about the same price as like half a pint. Um, people start to prefer community benefit funds instead. So that's money spread across the whole community. Um, so as you can see, while the 75 pound um, energy bill reduction does uh Boost support up even more to uh, 58%. The £250,000 fund for the whole community per year boosts it up to 62%. Um, and then we did have some quotes um, that which really fleshes us out. So £50 is neither here or there, but £200,000 in the community is a massive offering. Um, and then there's the, the Labour voters saying £200,000 without a shadow of a doubt. One or two things that could go into my village right now, which could really help out. Um, so that was that was certainly very interesting. Um, and then what this this helped to shape our recommendations, which I'll go on to in a minute. But people, instead of the community benefits, just going straight to the local authority or the developer deciding what it is or the Treasury deciding what it is, as was the case with the landfill tax, uh, people wanted local control over those community benefits and how to direct those funds. So by far the most popular choice with who who does direct those is not well, yes, elected representatives, so local councillors, but also um, people from the local community. So business people, head teachers, uh, charity organisations, and also just people who live in the in the local area. Um, so that brings us on. Uh, I'm trying to move swiftly on for presentation so we can get to the sort of juicy debates. Um, that moves us on to the recommendations, which is the Green Energy Covenant. We base this on three principles. Um, so they should be simple, fair and direct. Uh, so by simple, I mean a predictable amount of investment. People should know what they're getting. Also, developers should have to deal with easy, understandable, simple regulation. A fair deal. So not just for the people who live nearby and are hosting the infrastructure, but also the people who uh, well, wider bill payers. They shouldn't have to face unfair bill rises to um, pay off, for example, free energy for everyone. Um, but then there's also direct. So this should go straight to the community as per that, that last polling slide. So 
the way we figured that we do this, and there's three steps. The first one is amending the national policy framework um, so that all community benefits for renewable infrastructure and transmission grid infrastructure, and that's the big stuff, the stuff that's like the size of Nelson's column, um, is automatically considered necessary, directly related, and fair and reasonable. And that's the criteria in the MPPF to decide whether community benefits should be attached or not. So it automatically sales through the um, planning process. Everyone knows that they're going to be getting compensation um, and community investment in return for hosting infrastructure. It's a done deal as soon as the planning application goes through. Um, we also recommended removing footnote 54, which is where the uh, de facto ban on onshore wind is, because what we're essentially saying is as long as you um, have a good solid community benefits policy, um, you can respect polling that says that the onshore wind is very popular and you can align that onshore wind and do wider planning reform to lift the restrictions on renewable energy. Um, and then we come to the actual green energy covenant, which is a document that the government would publish. Um, and MPs would be able to, to point to it to say, this is what you're getting in return for hosting this infrastructure. And there's two, two main parts of this. So there's the payment rates and then the process. So for the payment rates, we recommended £2 per megawatt hour of the average base load of uh, the technology. Um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, Adam. Um, basically, instead of doing uh, £5,000 per megawatt, like in Scotland that they do for specifically onshore wind, we wanted something which would um lead to a lower amount of um um a, a lower amount of sorry a lower amount of uh of community benefit for uh, community benefit payments for solar um because it's less productive and then a higher one for um onshore wind turbines because they're more productive and at the bottom you can see that onshore wind would develop uh, deliver uh, nearly six million pounds um, over a 20 year lifespan, whereas solar would deliver uh, 2.5 million pounds um, over a 25 year lifespan. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, some lovely arrows. We also did some, and do please go and check out the report for grid infrastructure. So overhead cables up to 165,000 uh, pounds per mile. And this is all based on the Irish um, precedent. Um, same for underground cables at 3% of the capital cost and then substations too. Um, and then we also had some guidance for uh, how to deliver this. So engaged communities within three miles of the assets, um, developers should convene local boards, as we were saying earlier, that local board then develops an action plan to direct that investment. Um, you have uh, section 106 payments uh, paid by the developer or a third party if they want to outsource it. Um, and then you also give more influence in, in route designs for cables and um, renewable energy projects. And then finally, we wanted to revive the community and a bit community benefit registers, sorry, um, which uh, used to exist in England. They collapsed um, due to bad maintenance, basically, and they exist in Scotland, too. This is something that uh, it's like an online portal where developers can track payments um, and they can uh, give information about the projects and make sure that it's all going to plan. Um, so you want to bring them back, make them really good, increase that transparency um and have communities uh, take inspiration for what they could spend their community benefits on um so i'll wrap up there i know i must be going over time already that is great thank you jack there is a huge amount in that report and i do encourage people kind of put the link to the full thing in the chat to go away have a read dive into some of the detail we've tried to be very practical with how we have set it up um let's Let's go to you, Ed, for a response. I'd be really interested in your, your thoughts on the report, how it aligns with your current thinking and what potential the proposal might have. Great, um, Adam. And look, um, thank you so much. And I'm really um, delighted to be speaking at this um, onward uh, event. I'm aware there's a sort of certain paradox of me having these Labour posters behind me uh, and speaking at your event. And I looked up your mission statement, which is to develop bold and practical ideas for the next generation of centre-right thinkers and leaders. And I'm clearly not next generation, so I'm generationally sort of out, out of the picture and maybe ideologically or ideologically too. But I, in, in all seriousness, I'm, I'm, I was keen to speak at the event partly because I talked to Jack about his work and it is really an excellent report. Uh, and I really want to um, commend it to the audience. It's just really, really worth reading. 
uh, because it really wrestles with the difficult practicalities of this, uh, as well as the sort of high level principles. And I'll say something about that in a, in a minute. Um, but secondly, I just want to sort of make this point at the outset, which is, you know, I passed the Climate Change Act in 2008, and the cross-party consensus is incredibly important to me. Um, it is so important that this is a shared agenda across all political parties. And, and you know, we have prided ourselves in Britain on not having a US-style culture war over climate. And so I really sort of want to sort of encourage and commend the work of Onward, because I know you've been really big champions in the Conservative Party uh, for this agenda. And obviously, you've got MPs who are champions uh, of, of it as well, people like Alok Sharma and, and, and others. But I just want to sort of note that, and that's, that's the other reason I was keen to speak. Let, let me say four specific things uh, about the sort of report and its context, and then I'll, I'll just say something about, at the end about the task that we have in front of us. The, the first thing is, if I'd been talking to you when I was Climate Change Secretary, I would have been saying green is the right long-term choice for the country. That's what the Stern report shows. It's the right long-term economic choice, and it's also the right environmental choice. I think it's really worth underlining what Jack said in his out in his opening, which is it's the cheaper choice. It is now the cheaper choice. And I think lots of people still aren't very clear about that. This is cheaper than fossil fuels. It's three times cheaper, approximately, uh, uh, than fossil fuels, re renewable energy, um, at least solar and wind. Um, and it's also the more secure choice. Uh, and again, that's a point you eloquently make uh, in the report. We're not dependent on the ups and downs of the international fossil fuel market. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, secondly, I think the report does an excellent job of busting the myth that renewables are unpopular. <laughs> Because sometimes to listen to um, what the current government says, you'd think this was onshore wind was absolutely hated. Actually, their own polling says that by I think it's some astronomical margin, like 78% to 5% people support onshore wind. And, and I think what um, Jack also rightly highlights is that's true even if people live near um, a wind or, or, or solar. Um, and so, and even among rural voters, and you're polling on rural voters, which I think you you highlight in your presentation, Jack, is really important. So that's secondly. First, it's cheaper. Secondly, uh, it's popular. But thirdly, and I think this is the really the heart of the report, um, even if it's popular and it's cheaper, if you are a community hosting this infrastructure, I think you should get some direct benefit from it. I mean, the whole country gets benefit from it, as the report says, from lower bills. But I think it's the right principle that communities that host this should see direct benefits to themselves. And you know, the report um, wrestles with this question of voluntarism versus compulsion and comes out on the side of compulsion. In other words, it shouldn't be a sort of option for the developer. It should be just a necessity. And I personally think that is the right uh, position. Because I think, and we were discussing this just before we came on, I think part of the headache for developers here is, in a sense, more guidance is their friend, not their enemy. Um, because, you know, if each developer has to negotiate, uh, is there going to be community benefit? How much of community benefit? It all feels very, very uh, chaotic. And so, I think a clear expectation and requirement that there is that there is local community benefit for all types of clean energy infrastructure by the way I, th I think you're right to say it should be for grid as well as for uh, solar and wind has got to be the right thing to do um and the report also is 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 quite it has a passages that, that that talk about this idea that this isn't bribery this is about just recognizing that communities are doing a service for the country by hosting this infrastructure and they should get benefit from it so i completely endorse that principle fourth then the sort of nerdy aspects of the report on the nature of the um of the benefit that should be offered. I, I, look, we all want to study these in, in detail, but let me pick out a couple of things that I think are sort of important. I think one is communities themselves need involvement in the way this money is spent. And I think it is, and, and obviously there's different ways of doing that. And I hear what you're saying about the relative role of you know, 
geographically small local communities and the wider local authority. But I think it's very, very important, however it's done, that there is, you know, the local, if a solar farm or a wind turbine is coming to a local area, you know, local people need a say in how that how that community benefit is spent. Um, and I think from my own local experience, I think that is really uh, important. And then I, I won't get into the detailed question of the rates and all that, because we need to look at that. I think it, it is interesting, though, that people initially think, well, we want money off our energy bills, but then think actually the amount of our energy bills wouldn't necessarily be big enough. Maybe what we want more is sort of wider kind of community, you know, you know sort of aggregated benefits to the community that will really make a big difference. And I think there's more, and I think there's really interesting work to be done about how you adjudicate on that, what that benefit looks like um, and how it works. Um, so, so, you know, this report gives us really important uh, sort of food for thought on that. Um, I also personally really like the idea that each community and each developer doesn't have to come up with its own scheme. You want, and this is partly why having it as mandatory is right, you want an off-the-shelf scheme that developers know is the scale of benefit there's going to be, um, and if possible, how it's going to work and how it's going to properly involve local communities. And the more evidence you can draw about what does work and what doesn't work practically on the ground here and in other countries, the better. Let's make one other point before I finish, before I could sort of say something substantive in conclusion. I'm also struck, although this isn't exactly within the terms of the report, the extent to which countries like Germany and Denmark have really kind of driven community ownership of, of projects. And we've got this uh, GB Energy Local Power Plan, which wants to build on that. And in a sense, I think partly what we're dealing with here is there's a kind of ground floor of this, which is wherever there is clean energy infrastructure, communities get benefit. And then there's, if you like, a more engaged level where people could be actually owners on the ground. And I don't see why that shouldn't be happening. And I think it reflects people's sense that, look, we don't mind being part of this, but we want to feel like it's not being done to us just from afar with no benefit for us locally. Last thing I just want to say is this, which goes back to where I started. Um, you know, this summer, is such a clear kind of warning to us about the world we live in. I mean, lots of the pictures that we've seen from around the world look like scenes from a disaster movie, frankly. Um, and so it can feel very daunting. And, and it just goes back to this point about how do we tackle this, this enormous challenge that we've got. And I, you know, Keir Starmer talks about his five missions, and I think there's something very important in this, which is the way I think about this. This has got to be a mission that involves businesses, engineers, scientists, local people. This is why this report is so important, and people of all political parties. And I just want to sort of end on this point, which is that, look, if I'm secretary, if I'm lucky enough, if we have a Labour government, and if I'm lucky enough to be the Secretary of State, I want to work with organisations like Onward. Because I think you need to have you know, all political parties involved in this. That the scale of this challenge is so great that frankly we need the biggest tent possible of people. You know, there's no monopoly of wisdom in this. Uh, and, and we need the biggest tent possible of people uh, uh, to make this happen and happen in a fair way. So most of all, just want to say thank you to Jack. It's such an important piece of work and I, and I hope Onward carries on working in this area and can hopefully kind of help us with our plans uh, for government. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ed. Both those kind words, the analysis, and, and more broadly your thoughts on the report. Steph, let's, let's come to you. You've been covering these topics for some time. What were your reflections as you read the report and your thoughts on how likely this is to be picked up and running? So, um, uh, as Jack said, opposition to transmission infrastructure is particularly high in East Anglia. And that's something the Express has um, highlighted in our coverage. I often speak to campaigners and some of our readers who particularly have an issue with National Grid's plans for a 112 mile stretch of 164 foot pylons across the countryside. Now, as we've heard, it's not realistic for every single person to be supportive of every single development. 
but local consent is hugely important. And I've spoken to dozens of people who live along this route who will be impacted, who have very real concerns and who are really angry. Firstly, I think it's very important to say, and as the polls have shown, I have never spoken to a resident who is unsupportive of uh, the green industrial revolution, of decarbonizing the energy sector. Everyone is very on board with that. But they haven't they claim that green energy is not delivered, is not green if delivered destructively. A lot of people view themselves as guardians of the countryside. They have nurtured their relationship with nature during the pandemic. Some people live in places who have these beautiful vistas that have been undisturbed for 300 years, who have been um, commemorated in, in famous English paintings. Um, who, and and they, they want to protect that. There's a preservation of views of landscapes of agricultural land as well. And then there's the other side of things, which is uh, the consultation and the engagement with these communities, which they call piecemeal and an unplanned approach. Uh, I know uh, the report mentions community benefits. Ed's spoken about community benefits. I spoke to some campaigners this morning on the back of the report and um, it seems like that's not going to cut the mustard for everyone. Some people want direct compensation. Um, and that's, that's something we can talk about. In terms of MP support, uh, MPs are often uh, driven to do what their constituents, um, how they're feeling. So if you get the people on board, you're, you're very likely to get the MPs on board. But it's really, really interesting research. Fantastic. Thank you, Steph. But I think a, a welcome dose of kind of realism that there are going to be some people you get over the line, um, but you certainly will not get them all. And we've had tons of good questions coming in. Please do keep uh, adding them because uh, I'll direct some of them at our panel. Um, I want to come to you first, Jack. One of the questions that we've had in, indeed, one of the things Ed mentioned was shared community ownership. And that actually there's a real opportunity here to get communities not only benefiting from programs delivered by someone else, but developing their own projects and having an asset which they can draw down over a longer period of time. Was that something you considered as part of this report? Do you see that as complementary or opposed to, to what you've set out and what, what role might community ownership play? Um, so absolutely, I'm very, very pro community ownership uh, of, of energy projects. Um, and there are some really, really good examples out there. And I know um, it's a really big part of uh, Labour's local power plan. Um, and what we did in the report was say, if uh, if community ownership is on the on the table and a developer wants to hand some shares away to the local community, then absolutely you should be able to deviate away from the original package that the government would suggest and maybe do that instead. The main thing that um, we wanted to do is have a standard offer where uh, you have a, a certain amount of revenue coming in, regardless of if uh, the profits of a of a uh, development goes up or down. So then that allows for long term um, investment, um, and there might be a way to do that of community ownership. Um, but if it's if it's fundamentally if the rates are attached to the, the profit, which is what community ownership often is, then um, there might be a better way to in, ensure long term investment. And we think that our green energy covenant is the way to do that. But absolutely. 100% behind community ownership there are some apps like really great fantastic um, examples in the UK and particularly across Europe like like Ed said. Fantastic thank you um, Ed one of the questions we got was about uh, from Jeffrey was about well why not use parish councils for this and there's a question I guess whether it's community benefit or community ownership about whether you use existing local governance parish councils district councils whatever else or you create a sort of board or a body that drives this at maybe a more local level. How are you guys thinking about that? That's all definition governance. I mean, look, I'm I'm sort of open on this, really. I mean, I'm I'm because obviously I, I you know read what the report said. I see I, I, my sense from the report, but but Jack should say what he thinks is the worry in the report feels like you know. In a small geographic area, the solar farm or the onshore wind turbine is built, and then it goes into a, 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 a much larger geographical, a, a council covering a much larger geographical area, and therefore the local people don't see any benefit from it because it gets spent on something else somewhere else. And so, and I think that fee, so, so it felt like, and, and Jack will say if I'm wrong about this, but it felt like that was in that was part of the anxiety. So whether it's parish councils you know uh, local people plus councils i'm sort of 
kind of open minded on that, really. I just do think it needs to benefit a local area where the clean energy infrastructure is happening. And it needs to have some input from people in the local area. So it isn't sort of so they're not getting something they don't particularly want or which doesn't reflect local local views. So you know what the precise mechanism is, I'm not sure, but that would be my my principle. Steph, what are your thoughts on this question? So, you know, uh, at, when you see local resistance in areas, what do you think might best um, overcome that? Would it be at a priority level, community level? What are your thoughts? I think certainly early engagement and then flexibility in uh, the route that infrastructure does take. So I'd be very keen to jump into journalism mode quickly and ask Ed how Labour plans to engage uh, communities and to make sure that communities do have a genuine say instead of riding kind of roughshod over, over people. But I think that early engagement is vital. People ultimately want to uh, feel like what they say matters instead of just the box ticking exercise, which I think is what a lot of communities feel is happening now. And is that, are you specifically talking about the national, the, 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 the East Anglia grid experience? Yeah. You see, I think, I think, Steph, that I'm, I'm sure there are lessons to be learned from the process of consultation around, uh, the, you know, the, the, the grid and what, and what has been, has been happening. Um, I agree with you that this has got to be done in a way that is nature positive and that, and that you know, protects nature. I, I do also think, though, this local benefit thing is important because I think people having a guarantee that they're getting something out of it is, is important. All that said, you know, I just got to be honest, we are going to need that to build this infrastructure. Now, some of it can be offshore. Uh, for example, a lot of it can be offshore, actually. I think of the 17 projects, uh, the so-called ASTI projects that have been agreed with Ofgem, I think lots of them are offshore, but some of them aren't. Uh, and, you see, I can't help feeling that there is a silent majority on this. I mean, what, what Jack's research suggests is actually there is a lot of support for this, um, for these, for, for developments. I don't know whether Jack's done specific work on, on grid, but certainly as far as renewable energy is concerned, it you know, the impression is that people, local people oppose it, but that's not the truth, actually. Um, now, I don't know, I, as I say, I don't know whether Jack's got research on the grid, but I mean, in the end, we are going to have to build this infrastructure. We've got to do it sensitively to nature. We've got to listen to local people and talk to local people. We've got to make sure they get benefit out of it. But we are, but, and, and the answer is, we're not going to have we're going to carry on having very expensive energy unless we make unless we build this infrastructure. I mean that is the that is the truth, uh, and every country in the world is um, is grappling with this, or every country that's making the transition. Uh, my my Australian friends have this um, uh, slogan, which is uh, "There's no transition without transmission," um, which is sort of you know which is kind of correct. So it's got to be done sensitively to people and nature, and with good consultation. But it's also got to happen. There's, there's some questions coming in here about kind of communications, and Jack, I'll, I'll come to you on this first, and then then you have your thoughts. One on what are the lessons from other successful government communications? So someone mentions the digital switchover. Jack says, Jack, the questioner says the digital switchover was an example of government comms done well. You know, making something clear. Is there a similar thing to be done around transmission? And, and Jeremy asks, you know, any political consensus would be fragile if the public is still in different places on this. So how do you get the public on side? So. Jack, I mean, you talk about some of the polling on uh, support and how it changes. If the government said, how do we communicate this? How do we make the case? What would you be saying? So I think this is, this is kind of what we wanted to do with the Green Energy Covenant. We wanted to have that physical document that gives, gives the guidance to the developers. Essentially, what we're doing is, especially on the engagement, like how to engage early, engage often, um, who to engage within the three miles, et cetera, et cetera. We're basically just kind of trying to almost um, enshrine like gold standards, stuff that a lot of developers do already. 
Um, and we've, we've got lots of fantastic case studies in the report. It's just that there's often um, developers who maybe don't do that and they're, they're not so good on the engagement. And I think the important thing is, and we found this in our focus groups as well, is that fundamentally people want to be involved. And that to go back to the, the, the question about councils, um, that's why we said it needs to be even more local than councils. We need to go, we need to have parish councillors, for example, on those boards, but it needs to be part of a wider community because that's what people want. They want to have the, um, the discussion and the debate. So. In terms of government comms, I mean, there's there's absolutely the government needs to do really good communications around this, but that's kind of what we're trying to um, provide this as a kind of a vehicle for government comms on this, I suppose. Yeah. And, and Ed, how do you think about that? I mean, should this be an exercise in the government trying to win hearts and minds on this or ultimately there'll, there'll always be a, a run for opposition? And so that's that's less important. No, you should definitely try and win hearts and minds on this. I mean, look, you should definitely engage with people. I mean, you're not going to ever, Steph said it well, you're not going to bring um, everybody with you, um, but you should definitely engage with people. And, you know, I suspect that Grid will probably want to learn lessons from the way that they've engaged with people in East Anglia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you should do your absolute best to to do that uh, without question and that's kind of why you know it's not the only solution but that's why i think this community benefit thing is important because i think it's a signal that we that of seriousness about this and it isn't simply about just saying well it's going to happen without any benefit to the local um uh community and you've also got to listen to pe what people say about are there other options and so on in the end the, the building does have to take place somewhere um, and you've got to look at the cost because some people say, well, we should underground everything, but undergrounding everything, as the report says, is, I think, up to five or ten times more expensive. And that goes on everybody's bills. So that's not straightforward. You know, that's not straightforward. Um, uh, there are, are offshore options in some cases. Uh, that's true. So I think I think all you know, you've got to do all of those things, but you do also need to get on with it as well. I mean, if I if I'm honest, I think part of the problem here is the system has no guiding mind at the moment. And that is the role that the new future systems operator is hopefully gonna play. And I've obviously talked to them because at the moment it feels like a very balkanized system without a proper sense of, well, who is actually overseeing this system and how are they thinking about the grid and all of those questions. And that's what needs to happen really. Excellent. And then I, I wanna to turn to Kind of international examples, so things that we can learn from abroad. And, and Jack, I'll come to you then. Then Steph, then then Ed. So a lot of the questions in the chat. So Steve's been asking about Steve and um, programs in uh, Scotland. We've got some other people saying, and there are things that we can learn from north of the border. We talk about that bit in the report. But actually, you mentioned that Ireland was one of the benchmarks we're using for transmission. That I think they've got similar schemes in in Germany. So what can we learn from abroad about what has worked and what hasn't, um, and what does that mean for the proposals here? So Jack, you first. So yeah, we for, for grid, and it is it is more challenging to Steph's point earlier. Um, I think there's something about renewables that people look at them and go, like, cool, we're fighting climate change and it's nearby, and it's quite it's quite nice to see a, a big wind turbine or a, a solar farm, and that means cheap energy and stuff. Whereas a grid, it tends to be, especially the old um pylons that uh, like you see along the motorway, big quite big ugly gray structures um so it's definitely more of a challenge uh on that side so we went to ireland uh, not literally but we we went to ireland to to see what they're doing and they've they've got a really really good community benefits policy for air grids probably the best in in europe i think um and i i know france has got a good one it's not quite as good as ireland so it doesn't quite lead to as much flexibility in the payments etc um but I know Germany is also bringing in now some regulations around transmission grid. All of Europe has this problem, by the way. I know, like in Britain, we like to sort of go, oh, God, we're surrounded by NIMBYs. We can't build anything. And woe is us and everything like that. But it's a challenge across Europe that people um, will push back against infrastructure in their local area. It's an actual human thing to not want your um, local area to change um, unless they get these, these tangible local benefits in return. Um, and we also did look at um, that. We definitely did look at uh, north of the border as well. And, and Scotland does have um, what appears to be a very successful um, community benefits policy. It is advisory. And I think like so they advise five thousand pounds and it's just for onshore wind. They don't have anything for for solar. Um, and actually the average for um, community benefits paid 
um, in Scotland is below the advised rate. So it's £4,500 on average rather than £5,000. So I think what we're trying to do is, is build on, on Scotland's fairly good community benefits policy, but apply it to um, other technologies, so especially to solar and also grid, where we're having a lot more of a challenge, um, and then have that going across the UK. So we did we did learn from um, other, other European and other UK precedents, um, but we, we think this might be the, the next step. Thanks, Jack. Steph, are there things you think we should learn from abroad on how to get some of this stuff done? Uh, as Jack uh, mentioned there, that resistance happens everywhere. That's not unique to the UK. I think sometimes what other countries have done slightly better is just that consultation with the people. It's starting to engage much earlier. As Ed did say, um, things could be learned from national grids uh, consultation with people, for instance. So um, as more of these projects pop up, the UK will change its ways and figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, in terms of East Anglia, I think a lot of campaigners, for instance, have called for an integrated offshore grid, which I think something that's something Belgium um, uh, has does or is, is further along with. So I think um, the UK uh, is definitely pioneering in some regards, but definitely has a lot to learn. And the media, also to the previous question as well, the previous point, the media plays a huge role in shaping a public opinion. So we have a responsibility to highlight when things go right um, and showcase when Britain's leading the way, but also hold the country to account in when other countries are, are doing better and when we have something to learn from. And Ed, you mentioned your friends in Australia. Are they kind of are they an inspiration for you when you think about this? Are there others that are really getting this getting this right? Well, I had a series of meetings actually at um at COP27 about this with some of my counterparts. I mean, my sense was, and again, this is one of the reasons why the, um, the report is important, was while it doesn't break down all the opposition, people getting local benefits out of this does make a difference because people, I think it's, 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 it's obviously about the substance of the community benefiting, but it's also a sense of kind of, uh, a recognition, really, uh, communities being recognised for what they, for the service they're providing to the whole, to the, to the wider country. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure, saying that that's a complete answer, but I think that from my my sense is that that is part of the answer. I'm also intrigued by what Jack says about Ireland. Uh, Jack, are you saying that in Ireland, um, the their the approach on the grid has worked better? Um, so we just we looked at their community benefit. It's just very, very well developed. Um, and they have some funds that go to the, the local community. They'll also have um, I've heard a lot that people who, who live closest to the pylons, they really want compensation because they're the most impacted. So I think they have a policy of if you're 200 metres away from the line, then you get even more and it's going straight to your household. Um, I don't think it's re-energy bill rebates, it's just for a direct payment, for example. Um, but you get even more. My, we, we did raise it in the report. Um, my one thing is, is it's like what happens when you're 210 metres away from the pylon. But I think that would be up for the government to decide as it's developing its um, grid transmission uh, policy um but it, from from what what boys seen in ireland it's, it's definitely the most comprehensive it's got a really good um document is you find all the information if you were someone who's having infrastructure built near you you're going to know what you're what you're entitled to essentially and that's kind of what where we want to be going um at onward where we where we think the government should go rather um with its community benefit policy both for renewables but also for for grid infrastructure as well and it was it was just a bit more difficult to find it in other european countries um, I so I've had a very specific question come in both here and on YouTube. If it's the same person, well done because that's worked. But uh, it's on nodal pricing. So the question here, Jack, just to kind of abstract a bit away from it, is should uh, the amount of community benefit differ based on how much electricity might cost in that area? Should we move to a more localized system? Might be a bit inside a baseball, but I have a sense that the people that are joining this webinar are up for this stuff, right? So, Jack, is that something we should look at, or should it be a standardized system? Um, yeah, so it's an incredibly live debate in um, Energy Wonk world. Um, I know off gems quite up for it. Basically, nodal pricing, um, it's not its not a community benefit. It just means that you're redesigning the way that power is priced so that if you're closer to renewable energy or indeed any other kind of energy, a nuclear power station, for example, you're going to get cheaper energy. Um, and actually, nodal pricing would reduce the amount of transmission 
grid that you need because you just build the stuff closer to demand. Um, I, we sort of haven't really gone into it in this report. Um, we, I know onwards, um, my predecessor, Ed Burgett, he was kind of like the, the guru of um, nodal pricing. Um, I'm hoping he's watching uh, today because it might have even been him that asked that question. Um, mm-hmm. But it'd be it'd be very interesting to see where the debate goes. I know it's, it's a big part of um, the review of electricity market arrangements, uh, but we kind of wanted to avoid that because it's it's not really a community benefit Um but I'm I'm fairly agnostic. It's a whole debate which I'm, I'll try and not get into now <laughs> too much. Um, is this something Ed that you guys are looking at on a local electricity pricing? I mean, look, I don't want to totally prejudge this review that is um, is going on. Um, I mean, I have I have a at least one cautionary note, which is that I think people. I know the price is not completely uniform across the whole of the UK, but I think you don't want a postcode lottery in energy pricing mm. for, for consumers. Um, and look, there's obviously great complexity to this issue, so I don't want to be sort of simplistic about it, but I, I would really quite worry about a postcode lottery. Um, because it's not like consumers are making those decisions. It's not. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a consumer decision that leads to what what price they charge. It's the amount of renewable power that is in a particular area or demand in a particular area or whatever. And I think, you know, one of the things that people expect is a sort of reasonably uniform national price. I mean, so, but but that isn't to say there aren't you know that there aren't other sort of complexities here that we need to look at. But that's just a sort of instinctive uh, view. And one of the questions we've well, a couple of questions we've had have been about how directive the government should be about what this money is spent on, right? So Jack, you in the report have gone quite broad that actually communities should choose. Uh, Robin has asked, shouldn't we just direct it towards energy efficiency measures because that will both kind of benefit the environment, reduce prices over time and uh, help us people through lower bills. Um, an anonymous person has just asked, what about amalgamating some of these funds? So instead of having 18 communities with an EV charger or something similar, you might have an electrified rail link across Yorkshire, this person says, right? So should we direct people towards kind of environmental investments with a community fund? And should we allow them to pool some of their funds collectively? Uh, Jack, and then I'll, I'll come to you, Steph, on those questions too. Um, so yeah, we, we did do some some polling on what would people like their community benefits to be invested in. And actually home upgrades came first by a long shot. And we um, did uh, some quite cool um, thinking around like, could you maybe get the community benefit fund, pay that with some social housing decarbonisation fund from the government, for example, maybe get Lloyd's or NatWest or Santander who are doing like work on um, uh, concessional finance um, through the UKIB. Uh, the UK Infrastructure Bank um, to expand that pie and and try and upgrade everyone's homes because then they would get even larger bill cuts um, and yeah I'd be a big fan of that I'd also be a big fan of um, nature restoration projects that was often very popular in our focus groups I think in our in our in in the green energy covenant though we don't want to be too prescriptive because some communities especially if it's like maybe a a small village next to quite a large wind farm they might just want the free energy Um, and we don't think it should be up to the the government to decide what it's spent on but as a as a greeny energy policy guy I would absolutely be very up for a lot of cash going into energy efficiency especially given that we've struggled with that quite a lot over the past 10 years. Steph what are your thoughts? I think communities don't want things imposed on them. And as Jack mentioned earlier, local leaders will know what their their immediate neighbors, their community needs. So leaving it in the hands of local leaders is what's best. And in some parts of the country, that will be um, home efficiency upgrades. In another part, it might be nature restoration. But um, again, I think people, the key to this um, community benefits thing is just that it doesn't come across as pitiful bribes, I think. People want to see direct, tangible benefits from having this infrastructure on their doorstep. doorstep. So it should ultimately really be up. It should be their choice and what, what happens with that. And let, Ed, let me come to you on this question of bribes, actually, because a couple of people have said, isn't this in the, in the chat, in the questions, isn't this just a bribe, a bung to a local area to get them to do something they don't want to do? 
Do you think that's a, you know, an unfair characterization or maybe that's, you know, uh, an uncharitable way of describing it, but sort of fine. How, how do you think about that? I mean, I understand why people say that, but I think that Jack deals with this quite well in the report because he, he, he correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, but you sort of say, look, it's not a bribe. You're actually just saying to people, this is something that's going to benefit the whole country, but you're hosting, you, your area is hosting this power or grid. So you should get some benefit from it. I mean, I don't think it's a bribe. I think it's just more a sort of recognition that, you know, some people would rather not have this in their area. So there should be a local benefit to that area from this from this clean power or clean power infrastructure. I mean, that's sort of the way I think about it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask one final question and come to the full panel, like, which has come from Ed from the European Climate Foundation, who very kindly have supported uh, this work and our broader work on net zero, which is kind of what other things did we look at as we were developing the paper? You know, if our exam question is, how do you accelerate the rollout of renewables in a way that is just and fair? And there are other things we looked at that might have been a close second in terms of an idea to community benefits. Um, and if so, kind of what are they? Let's flesh out what a broader package might look like. So um, I'll, I'll come around to you guys uh, and any other kind of concluding thoughts, Jack, Steph, and then, then Ed. Um, so we did, we list them out in the in the recommendations and we say why we haven't gone for those options. So there's, you could maybe attach it to CFDs, but then that only applies to CFD projects, for example. And um, there's the community infrastructure levy, but then you're handing the cash to the, the well, you're basically making the local authority pay and that would take um, money away from local authorities instead. Um, there's doing the same thing as the landfill tax, but then it's the treasury and end trust kind of deciding what is spent on. So fuck that wasn't um, direct enough. So if you go into the into the recommendation section, um, you'll see sort of all the lists and then why we went for the MPPF, which is just because it's it's the most simple. And if you if you pub, do amend the MPP have to make them automatically obligatory to these kinds of infrastructure projects um, and then have a, a default offer um, then it, it just it just came out as the most simple easy lightest touch way to do it um, and, and yeah that's why I went for that option. Brilliant. Steph I mean you've said that this might not quite you know is it going to cut the mustard in some areas but there's really intense opposition to things like transmission what are some of the other things that maybe sit around this policy that might be a good idea? I think it mentions, for instance, like the creation of um, local boards and that could do really, really well, getting community action plans. I think all the recommendations that just bring community to the heart of these decisions. And there's quite a few of those. I'm so sorry to harp on this, but I really do think this is all about the people. It comes down to them and there's some fantastic recommendations to engage the people who are going to be impacted by all of these. So I highly recommend everyone listening, go read the recommendations. Um, there's, some, there's some really good suggestions in that. Very good, thanks, Steph. Uh, and Ed, I mean, I know Labour put out their own kind of plans around some of this stuff. What, what do you think are, are other things that sort of alongside things going? I mean, look, I think it's really good what Jack has done. And I think it, I think in a way it should encourage us all to think more creatively about how we deliver this clean energy revolution that we're that we're embarking upon. And and the way to deliver it, I think this report is saying is don't just do more of what you've already done, do it differently. <laughs> You know, get local people to benefit, have community ownership. You know, we want to fund not just work with local authorities in the private sector, have community ownership. We want to encourage people to do what they've done in Lawrence Weston in a housing estate in Bristol, which is a community owned uh, wind farm with profits going back into the community. We think there's huge potential to do that with low cost loans or zero interest loans to local communities. I think, you know, I think there's I think we've tended to think about this in quite a uh, sort of one size fits all way in, in this country. And I think thinking about, and I think Steph is completely right about this. How do you put people at the heart of this so people really feel they are, they kind of own this, either with a big O or a small O, they own this change that is happening and they kind of, you know, can see that the, the benefit of this. And, you know, it's like, we know that this is going to be in cheaper bills. Let's bring that benefit home to people so that they see it for themselves that this is this is a good thing for communities. And I, I think honestly, finally, I'd say we are pushing it an open door because, you know, yes, there's issues about certain projects and you know, some of the issues around East in East Anglia around the grid, but overall, I think the report saying, hang on, you know, let's have a reality check here. Renewable power is popular, is a really, really important message to understand. 
Fantastic. Agreed. And I think that in terms of pushing an open door at a time when it's difficult to find additional money to invest in communities, particularly those rural communities that have been at the hard end of a whole set of changes over the past few decades, this feels like a real um, win-win nationally, locally, politically, in policy terms. Um, and so we've got time for. So I just want to say thank yous. One, thank you so much to um, you for joining us. So, you know, kind of five to six on a muggy July afternoon. We're delighted that people have tuned in and those on YouTube and on the webinar. Secondly, to the European Climate Foundation for supporting all the work we do at Onward on Net Zero. Uh, and finally, to our, our panelists, to Jack, to Steph, and to Ed, really grateful to you for giving up your time. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening and hopefully see you soon.